Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, we are honored to have with us today the remarkable Dr. Raja Al Garg, a businesswoman, a devoted daughter, a loyal wife, a caring mother, a true advocate of preserving cultural values while achieving success. Today, we delve into her extraordinary journey, navigating the success while challenging stereotypes, embarrassing authenticity, and breaking taboos. Dr. Rajal Gurk, welcome, and thank you for being here with us. Well, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim It's my honor to be here today with all of you, and uh, we will make it an open sitting discussion nicely and friendly and cozy so that we all can gain and whatever is there from my experience, what is needed from me, I'll be very, very happy to pass it because I know that the young generation are the future of this country. So, uh, uh, Abdul Qadir, you can start your questions. I know you have been talking to me, but uh, I think it will be a more formal talk now. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Dr. Raja, your journey has been nothing uh, but short of inspiring. You've shattered stereotypes and debunked myths about the sacrifices women must make for success. Can you share a personal experience that counters this myth and illustrates how you've managed to excel in your career while fulfilling your roles as a dedicated daughter, devoted wife, and loving mother? Well, uh, let me say one thing uh, to the new generation that I always advise is that our generation was the most uh, lucky generation in United Arab Emirates because we were one of the, gener uh, the only generation that really lived the past with all its hardness with all its, uh, there is no luxury, nothing. You know, you live day by day. And even when you go to school, we don't have uh, ACs, we don't have, but we, we managed to do it. And now we are living the present of this life in United Arab Emirates, where it makes a lot of difference. Now, people who live the hard way, they appreciate whatever they are in and looking forward to see what is the future going to be. Now to me, to balance uh, my career with my uh, uh, family life, I think why I said we are very lucky, because at that time when I graduated from Kuwait University in uh, 1977, but please don't count the years, huh? uh, I graduated from Kuwait University and we came here and we were the first lot in Dubai. Uh, and uh, maybe the second or the third lot in United Arab Emirates because Sharjah was uh, the first. And uh, we really managed to uh, come into the, uh, uh, into the education sector because there was nothing else that we were uh, uh, you know, going to go to except education being a teacher. And I managed to come, but luckily enough at that time, at that period of time when I was really uh, uh, getting into life to, have, to marry, to have children and all, it was a nice, easy life. Although it was very difficult financially, it was difficult the way of living at that time, but it was an easy life because we used to finish work at 1.30, approximately 2 o'clock. By the time we reach home, our kids have come back from school. So we taught our kids, we looked our, after our kids, and uh, I mean, I never ever brought a, a, a special teacher to teach my kid uh, a computer or to teach my kid uh, math or Arabic or English or uh, French even, but I learned, I learned computer from my kids, from their books, from whenever they started at that time, you know? So it was an easier life, but maybe I will be very, very frank is that if I have found that my career was going to damage my family life, I would have really stuck to my family. Mm. I wouldn't have gone uh, far uh, so much. 
my family will have the priority because I, I love the family environment. I love to give to the family. And I, I don't think I would have sacrificed my family for the sake of anything. But I was very ambitious. And this is how I really maneuvered how to balance between both. I was lucky with the timing. And I brought up my children. And once my children were um, old enough, uh, I, they didn't need me because they were in the secondary. And then some of them went to the university. So I had time for myself to really upgrade my, uh, uh, my talents, uh, look into the skills that I had, uh, the leadership skills that uh, everybody used to tell me that you are a leader, because I used to salute the flag in the school at that time, you know? And I used to pull the, the flag up, and I was the only one who will salute the, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the people there, you know, with the, the girls. So I was always leading. But I never thought that I will go so deep into leadership skills and into leadership studies and into leadership thinking of how to lead or how to lead an organization. But I led, I led my school as a Zabil Secondary School, one of the most important schools in Dubai. And uh, the graduates of that school up to date, uh, they will call me Abla Raja wherever they see me. And whenever anybody from my organization will go to finish any paperwork there in the Dubai municipality, RTA, DIWA, and so on, they will say, you have come from Isa Saleh al -Gurb. Do you work with Mrs. Raja? Yeah. She is my Abla. OK, thank you. OK, and this is my card. Please give it to her. Maybe she will remember me. I had almost 13 generation to graduate from there. And really, yes, it was, it was a miracle <clears throat> at that time. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, people really, at that time, they were uh, so good. And uh, they appreciated whomever they were. Up to yesterday, I was in one of the functions. And one of the students, she came. And really, I was so embarrassed. She, uh, she kissed my head. She said, you know, I have to tell you that you are the cause of my success. Uh -huh. I said, well, thank you very much. And I only was there until you were 17. But your success became afterwards. So this is how I started my career path. Actually, um, this is a really powerful message to reflect on, which is success doesn't uh, come at the cost of personal and familial uh, bonds. Um, the story is a testament uh, to that. Um, Dr. Raja or Abla Raja. Abla. <laughs> uh, continuing uh, on the theme of authenticity, you've authentically embarrassed your cultural traditions while navigating um, a rapidly challenging and a changing world. How have you maintained this delicate um, balance? And what value do you place on embarrassing your roots and conserving your identity, especially on a, glo a global stage? Uh, Abdul Qadir, here I would like to take away the embarrass, because I was never, ever embarrassed, neither of my tradition, nor from my religion, nor from my uh, being an Arab woman, UAE woman. I was never embarrassed. From 2002, as a founder of Dubai Business Women Council, we used really to travel all over the world. We did travel from, you can name it, America, Europe, all Europe, uh, Japan, um, um, Canada, uh, Australia, speaking about the women and the women issues in our part of the world and uh, uh, explaining to the outside world what are the women in United Arab Emirates are. Because the misconception about the women in our part of the world is huge. They think that the women are really uneducated, illiterate, just put on the shelf. They are only a housewife. Yes, me, housewife, being a housewife, it's uh, uh, an honor because I am a mother. I know how to make a family. It's not uh, something to degrade me. To degrade me. Yeah, it is. It's very, very important. And I must say that I am a working woman for the last 45 years. But um, my two daughters are not working. They are housewives, OK? But they are doing their own work from home. 
one uh, one is uh, a jewelry uh, uh, designer and the other one is calligraphist but uh, uh, that does not mean that their uh, 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 being a housewife deprived them from really working into the right career path to take uh, advantage of what can they learn and be for themselves and for their future. Uh, so I was never embarrassed. Uh, in all these um, uh, conferences that we attended, Definitely, you all know that uh, uh, within the conferences, they will tell you that uh, we will have an interview with you. OK, yes. And I remember in uh, Holland, uh, they told me, uh, uh, of course, we went as one group from United Arab Emirates, and our leader was from Qatar. And, uh, and it was on the Gulf side of it, yani all the Gulf. And we went there. and. Uh, uh, here he comes, uh, the boss comes and she says, Raja, I think they want to interview you. I said, okay. Uh, so what he says, uh, you know, but this person is very, very strong person. And this person is going really to ask you very embarrassing questions. See? I said, well, anyway, let him come and let him ask me the questions that he will ask me. If I can answer them, I will answer them. But if I can't answer them, I won't feel embarrassed. I will say, I don't know this knowledge. It's, uh, it's OK. I can learn it. Maybe later on, when I, he leaves me, I'll go and read about it. And I will come to know what does he mean or uh, how do I need to answer next time when I see it. And he said, but you know, this man has written the book for the queen or something. I said, it, it doesn't matter. He can write the book for anybody, for, for anybody, the okay. queen, the king, anybody, uh, merchant, anybody. But let him ask. Anyway, I went. And the first thing I sat and he asked me was about my will. You know, uh, don't you feel that uh, you, with this look, uh, you are not presenting a businesswoman. Said, okay, what do you see a businesswoman? Uh, do you see her with a Chanel and a uh, uh, and bag and uh, hair done and all that? You see a woman like that? It's up to you. It's, it's your culture. But you have to respect my culture and my traditions too. So he said to me, uh, I will have to ask you this. Why? Are you wearing this hijab? I said, OK, I will answer you. But let me tell you something. I need to ask you a question before I go deep into answering you. He said, yes. I said, uh, do you live with your family? He said, yes. I said, this morning when you woke up in the morning to dress up and to come, did anybody tell you there is something wrong with your look? He said, no. I said, well, that is very strange. I can tell you now that there is something wrong with your look, because your tie is not matching your suit. So how do you like that? Yes, how do you like that? He became so upset. I said, uh, thank you very much, but I don't want to continue this interview with you, because I am not here to be criticized. I am here to answer questions. I thought that you will be looking what is there in my brain to explore but not to look what is there covering my head to criticize. And I left him. So he went to the boss and he said, oh, really, I, I couldn't do with this. Uh, you know, she was very, <laughs> very tough for me. So it is like that. So I was never, ever embarrassed about how I looked. I always looked like that. Even in America once, they asked me, uh, how uh, your look does not deprive you from really be, uh, practicing business and being a career woman and all. I said, no, why do you um, uh, uh, accept every other nationality to dress up the way they dress up? And we respect them. Why don't you want to respect me with my tradition? Mm -hmm. This is my tradition, and I'm so happy with it. And I am very sure of myself that this is the way I want to look like. 
So they, I said to them, well, in fact, يعني, uh, don't misunderstand me, but I told them, in fact, I look like your nuns, you know, because the only thing is that I'm not wearing white color and white hair, but next time if you think that the white color will change your perception, uh, perception uh, I will wear a white uh, shirt under my abaya, يعني. Uh, it won't make any difference يعني, to me. But they did not know what to answer me. I said, when you look at, uh, with all my respect to uh, the Indian's lady, you will say, oh my God, she has a nice sari. And when you look at the European lady, you will say, oh my God, she's wearing this and that mark and that mark. But when you look at me, you will say that, why are you wearing like this? What is it to you? It's nothing to do with you. Yeah? So this is it. I never felt that I am embarrassed. I am sure of myself, and I know exactly what I want to say, what I want to pass, what, which message I want to pass. And uh, with all the respect in the world, I will not harm myself, I will not harm people. But from where did this authenticity came from? This power of being real, this power of preserving the culture? Uh, look, uh, Abdel Qadir, when you believe in yourself, and you believe that you want to work, I feel that I always want to give. I feel that this is my country, and I would really like to give. I went in different, different sections that I have nothing to do with it. I mean, I was, first of all, I was an English teacher. I graduated from Kuwait. I came, I had no idea about business. But when the, uh, the, uh, the chairman, Allah Yerhamah, he told me, okay, after 12 years, 13 years, he asked me one question. He said, Raja, I want to ask you one question. Can you answer me with um, honesty? I said, yes. He said, uh, in these 12 years, do you feel now, uh, at the latest stages, that you are go going around yourself? I said, what do you mean? That he said, that, are you learning anything every day? I said, no, because I am attending the lessons. I am looking after the, uh, the girls. I am advising the teachers. And I am attending classes with the inspectors. And that's all, you know? So he said, can you come? Because I think you have a lot of energy, a lot of talent, that you can work in business. Okay, I will work in business, but I have no clue what is there in business. Mm. Uh, and that was the turning point in my life, because uh, I said to him, okay, and at that time, if anybody can remember, or maybe your parents will uh, 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 told you that they used to give us three months holiday from the Ministry of Education. And this three months, we will go and uh, uh, travel with our children and all. I said to myself, this year, I'm not going to travel anywhere. I'm going to sit in Dubai, and I am going to go into business and see whether I fit or not, whether the atmosphere is good for me or not. And here, where I started, I stayed for three months and he told me, yes, you just choose the company. I chose interiors because interiors is, you know, something has to do with women, with, the, uh, you know, your taste and how you can uh, arrange the room uh, and arrange the uh, furniture and all. And I worked and I found myself, yeah, I'm learning every day. I'm learning something new here where I decided that I can move, you know. After six months, I moved to the business. But I told my father that uh, uh, don't expect anything from me because I will move into business, but I will have to study. He said, yes, you are coming to a university of business. You take your time. I am giving you 10 years to do the dealing and wheeling. And then here I said to myself, oh my God, 10 years? What is he talking about? I have built a nice, beautiful reputation for myself in education. Uh, for the last 12 years and 13 years. And he wants me to start from scratch. And this was the challenge to me, that I said that 10 years has to reduce. And I did reduce it to maybe four years, five years, as if I've gone really to a jama and yani to a university, and I graduated from there. And one of my uh, 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 yani skills that I had that I never felt shy of anything, and I never uh, asked for something that uh, will not teach me. 
-hmm. I always looked when I will sit in the board meetings, I will look at the uh, general manager of the whole group. And as soon as they will stay, uh, 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 start reading the budget, his eyes will go on that right figure. And he will ask the manager of that company, why your last year's uh, figure was this much and this year this much percentage you have decreased or this much percentage you have increased? What are the reasons for that? And here I told myself, you know, you, have, you better go out and ask this man, how does he catch all these uh, numbers? Because to me, it's something very, very strange. So when I, I go to him, I said, can you tell me, how do you look at that balance sheet? You know, can you teach me only? He they said, know how. Yeah, yeah how they know how. exactly. And I never left my thank you. Because whenever I don't know, I will ask for the information. And whenever I get the information, I will thank the person in front of me, whether he was older than me or younger than me. And I had that open policy door with my people that they can come. I don't have that uh, 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 bureaucratic uh, yeah. Yeah, the saying that they want to meet the MD and uh, or the chairperson. And this chairperson has to give them a, an appointment after uh, four weeks or five weeks. My appointment is on the spot. They will come to my secretary. Is she free? Yes, come inside. This is how I work. So I managed to do all that. So here where I found my uh, uh, belief in myself, my authenticity, authenticity. as you said. I, uh, what I did, uh, I don't want to say I, I all the time because. Um, <laughs> you have the right to. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I felt that uh, uh, to me, to write about authenticity, people have to know about my autobiography. Mm -hmm. How did I start my career? How did I come through my knowledge? My, uh, I mean, uh, even when I talk about knowledge and diversification and going here and there and there, uh, from education to business, banking. to banking, to, uh, health. Uh, uh, to health. Health, I mean, uh, to me, was something that I never thought that I will go into that uh, mm. sector. But uh, it proved that, well, I did very well. Yani, alhamdulillah, yani, I'm tawqiq min Allah, subhanah. Walakin, I did very well. Yani, for me, the first time I attend a kidney transplant in Dubai, the first time. You know that Sheikh Zaid has approved uh, the kidney transplant uh, and any yeah. organ transplant from 85, 1985. But nobody practiced it. And there was a doctor who is called Farhad Janahi, and he always used to talk to me. He said, you know, I want to do, but nobody is pushing me. Nobody is helping. I said, you know, I am not a doctor, but I'll push you into do, uh, doing that. And I did. And his first kidney transplant was uh, uh, brought from Saudi Arabia. And I attended, it was in Ramadan, I attended the full session with him for six or seven hours in the theater. But the only, yes, and the only advice they gave me, the doctors, don't come near the patient. Stand with your hands behind your back. Mm -hmm. And if we want you, we will call you. And I didn't know for what thing they want me. I am not a doctor, Yani. <laughs> but I stood there to look inside this lady's stomach and uh, uh, bringing that kidney after cleaning that kidney and putting it. And, uh, and then he said, you come here, this side. I said, OK. He said, uh, we finished. I said, but how do you know that the kidney is working? <laughs> you know, you might stitch uh, the stomach, and then the kidney is not working. How do you know? He said, I'll show you. So he, uh, he pressed on the al-halib. I don't know what do they, how do they call it in English, yani, al-halib. And uh, uh, like a rumkum, yani, all the urine came out from the tube. OK? He said, you see, the kidney is working. I said, now you can stitch. He said, no, but now you have to count for me how many pieces of um, tissues that I used to clean the blood and all inside the stomach. And it was 16 pieces. 
And I was counting myself. Nobody told me to count. But as they are putting, because I read sometimes that they forgot a scissor inside the stomach. They forgot I don't know what inside. You know? Yes, so this is how I used to uh, yani, <laughs> uh, collect knowledge. So I was 16. Uh, there was a, he said, uh, uh, now count how many I will get out. I said, no, how many you put inside? 16 you put inside. He said, are you sure? I said, yes. Then count as we are putting it out, uh, taking it out of the stomach, you count it. And I was counting it uh, from far away. 16, it was 16. Thank you very much. So uh, 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 to me, to go to that sector, it was something unbelievable. Yani. I didn't believe myself that I can do that. And the biggest challenge I had is that really creating Mohammed Bar Rashid University for Medicine. Mm -hmm. And that Mohammed Bar Rashid University for Medicine uh, uh, University, uh, uh, in five, six months' time, it was created. It was aligned with Queen's University from Northern Ireland, Belfast. Belfast yeah. And uh, uh, in no time, we really created, and the decree came. and. And uh, I am very proud to say that last year in 2022, we graduated the first batch of doctors. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah. So they were saying that, why do, uh, yani, uh, why do you think that it will, I said to them, you know, the, uh, the percentage of the, uh, of the girls will be more than the boys. He said, how do you know? I said, because we know our culture here. Because the families, uh, if their daughter want to study medicine, now, of course, it is more open. But at that time, yani, uh, uh, maybe eight, nine, ten years ago, uh, people will think, ah, I will send her to any place outside the country seven years, eight years. And that is if she succeeds also every year. Huh? And then she might take another one or two years because she will uh, uh, fail in one of the courses and all. And by the time she finishes, so most of her lifetime will be spent outside her country without her family and all. So I said, this will serve the purpose of the ladies. And it did. And now I, we can see that the, uh, the girls' percentage is higher than the boys' percentage in that university. The second batch, of course, is, is going to be next year. And I am so um, happy that something has come out. Now, when I came out of education, that is how I built my career. When I came out of education and came to the company, the first thing I said to the chairman, I said, you know that the best thing to do is that we should create a school. And that school should grow, and it will become a university. He said, no, no, I didn't bring you from the school to put you in a school. school. Okay. So I brought you from school to really serve me in business, not to, uh, to put you in another school. Because I know that you are going to stay there. You will not come to the business. So, uh, but uh, I couldn't make it for myself as a person. But I made it for my country uh, as a, a project that I am proud of. So this is how I maneuvered in my skills. Yeah, Actually, you know. mm -hmm. Actually, trying to connect the dots, and uh, I think uh, the experience that you had in interior design had a great impact of you being a talented observer when you entered the health sector. Yeah. And um, actually, the second, the, the upcoming question that I wanted to talk, talk about, or actually before going to do that, I want to reflect back to the story that you shared earlier about uh, the hijab. Hmm. And I remember from your book, and I remember two, sen two sentences, how I dress has nothing whatsoever to do with the quality of my leadership or my business achievements. Definitely. And another thing that you mentioned, but people like me still don't fit into the expectations of those in the Western world. And the third statement, which is, I have made my mission to change the perceptions of others. I did. I did. Because uh, when we went all over the world to speak about the women and the women in our part of the world, at the end of uh, 2006, we started 2002 and we ended up in 2006. And then at that time, we said to everybody, now come on. And the proof of the pudding, they say, is eating it. It's not only cooking it. Yeah, you you have to it. eat it. True. Right? I said, we are not going to go anywhere now to speak about ourselves. You people come to us. You come and see the achievements of the United Arab Emirates women. 
They are doctors, they are lawyers, they are in space now, let them come and see. Uh, they, are, uh, they are everywhere, not only teachers. They are in every single sector. So we are not going to come to, or we are not going to spend any effort going around also to speak uh, all the time to speak about the Dubai and the women and United Arab Emirates and the achievements of the women in United Arab Emirates. You come and see us. And do you believe that uh, more than 30 to 35 to even 40 ladies came from Canada, from Australia, to really sit and discuss business with us in Dubai? And we took them. We said, we are not going to, uh, uh, to just sit with you around the table and discuss. But you come and see our businesses. Every one of us took them to her business to show them that this is the business that I am running. This is the business that is successful. This is the business that's been there. Uh, and I remember the German delegation when they came, they said they will interview. I said, OK. They said, we will come to your office. I said, don't come to my office. So why? I said, because uh, I don't want you to come to my office. And this office, I had it only for the last two or three years, because uh, I don't want you to see that I'm sitting and a nice sofa is there, nice table is there. I worked from the, from the scratch. I worked from the warehouses. Mm. And I worked as a sale lady in Benetton. At that time, we had Benetton. Uh, and I don't want you to come and sit here and take my picture. I am sitting in a nice office and then go to Germany and put it on your TVs. And they will say, look at the uh, Eastern ladies. They think that they are doing business, but they are sitting in the luxury uh, offices, uh, enjoying themselves. Other people are doing the donkey work for them. OK? So yeah, this is, so I, uh, they said, where do you want? I said, go to my factories. I have factories, I have joineries, I have say, uh, uh, showrooms, and I will, I will uh, respect that, and I will be there for you to film whatever you want. And they did. And they said, thank you very much. Now, can we come to your office? I said, no, I will give you tea here. Yes. Uh, so it is, it is not that uh, uh, here where I want to, t to tell everybody, and even the, uh, the young uh, generation, that Please. it's not, yes, it's not only having offices to sit in uh, that will make you somebody. Yeah. You have to know yourself and build yourself from inside to make yourself strong so that when they say Amna is a leader, the, she should know that she is a leader because somebody else described her. But also there is a difference between describing you in front of you and describing you behind your back. Now, what will the people say when you leave this room? Mm -hmm. They will say, she is a genius. Or they will say, خليها <laughs> معلش منها. OK? Now, here where you have to balance and you have to show that what did you uh, 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 build or see, put the seed in your inside to make yourself strong. Strong doesn't mean that you have to fight with people and you have to yell at people and you, because you are a leader, because there are different kind of leaders. What, there is, are, what is being strong? What, what is the strength? Ah, the strength is to be a leader with special qualifications, mm -hmm. uh, that qualification that makes you a loved leader, not a leader that uh, everybody will say, Allah, ya akhda tawwa dakhal alayna hadha ma. <laughs> yes, it is true. I'm telling you from fact of life, yani. Uh, you have to build the leadership skills. Every one of you, of us all, we have that leadership skills inside us. But now how to nurture it? how to bring it up. I mean, a mother is a leader, a wife is a leader, a, a, a manager is a leader, but what kind of a leader? Now, there are some leaders who will really put a problem in front of you and will say, he will tell the team, by tomorrow at 5 o'clock, I want the answer, and all these problems should be solved. Thank you, bye, and he will get out. Now, do I, I and I'm uh, sorry to say that, do I call this man a leader or this woman is a leader? No, I don't call them leaders. I say uh, a leader should show the way how to tackle this problem 
and show the team that there is a teamwork. Yeah, I am part and partial of you. Let's sit and brainstorm. How can we solve this problem? Okay, you will take care of this, or you will take care, I will take care of this. And you build it as a team. Here, teamwork is very, very important. Now, when you leave the room as a leader and you have worked with your team as a team leader, then they will say, you know, if we have another question, we will go and ask him. They will have that opportunity of really going to the leader to ask him, uh, look, sir, we did this, 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 but uh, we find that there is a gap here. Yeah. Yeah, a, a good leader will tell them, yes, this gap, you can fill it with this. Uh, uh, or you can tackle it in this way. The team player. Exactly, team player, exactly. exactly. Because there are some leaders, they will tell you and they will dictate their terms and they will uh, leave you alone. But some other leaders, no, they will sit with you, discuss the issues, go through everything, and then they will give you, uh, they will leave the solution. Now, also some leaders will sit in a, uh, in a uh, meeting room and they will see that, yeah, this lady spoke, She's excellent. This gentleman spoke, yeah, he's okay. But there, was a, there will be one person who did not speak, okay, through the meeting. He did not speak. What do you think? He will, you will think that he, uh, a stupid man, no? Or a stupid lady. They, she, they don't have uh, any uh, um, knowledge to speak. But believe me that this man or this woman who did not speak in that meeting, that person, you can take a lot from him. It's not only when you speak, it's only when you keep quiet, because uh, there can be so many things in your brain that you don't want to discuss it, because maybe you will think that they will not take it in a positive way. But if you discuss it, you will discuss it very slowly. But if you are asked, OK, what is your opinion? then you will give your opinion. Maybe that leader will find that your opinion is much better than the 10 people who were uh, uh, speaking for the last one hour. Speaking of the um, collective success, because we're, I think we're living in a world where many people imagine that success is an individualistic thing or it's an individualistic effort. Um, Dr. Raja al -Garg, your commitment to your family's uh, extensive social responsibility, community support, philanthropy and contributions is uh, commendable and even that's uh, it started as a legacy from your grandfather not just even not just your father the chairman could you share with us um, how these efforts have reinforced your belief in success as a collective community-based uh, endeavor see success is not individual you can't clap with one hand you have to have the other hand to clap. <laughs> you. And uh, uh, thinking of yourself, you can be a successful person because your effort only, I think you are the most failure person. I'm sorry to say that, you know, uh, because uh, success depends on you and the people whom you are working with. I remember always the chairman, Allah Yerhama, he told me when I came, he said, look, these people who are in the companies working for you, these are the people whom you should respect and you should value. Because without them, you will never get one dirham from the market. Okay? So don't think that you are the boss there and you can say whatever you want and you can treat however you want. You have to respect your people. Once you respect them, they will respect you. So it is give and take. It's not only you who create a success in a company. It's you and your team. Here where we go back to the leader, a team. What will you leave behind yourself? What is the legacy that you will leave behind yourself? This is what we need to think of as a new generation or the coming generation. Of course, I. I spoke in my autobiography about my uh, experience for all the, uh, for, through my career path. Then when I had that experience, okay, what came out? Okay, everybody tells me leader, leader, leader. Let me uh, uh, dig into that. And this book came. And they heard the third one is coming. Inshallah. And here where uh, the third one will come is for who? It will be for the third generation. 
because now here a leader who passes smooth the performance and the operation of any, uh, I will say company here, uh, in a smooth way. And uh, uh, everybody is satisfied with this passing. But uh, if there was no uh, make, uh, um, system to pass, and that is the transition, and that is the uh, succession, then you are um, uh, you are going to uh, uh, you are not going to be a, a leader. You will be a failure in your leadership. So I am thinking really of uh, uh, studying how can a succession plan go for the third lead, uh, lead, uh, third generation of the family. Now here I didn't see uh, see where the qualifications come. I didn't put myself in that committee. Because I said, I am an old school. I don't want to impose my ideas. I am a consultant. Come to me and ask me mm -hmm. if you need anything. But I put all the family members who are young in their 20s and 30s. I said, you make a committee and you sit and study for me the succession plan to move this business from me and the shareholders to you people. I think this is the greatest ever um, model of youth empowerment yeah. um, through making sure that there is an advisory board, there is someone who's guiding them without uh, influencing yeah, their decisions. Exactly. And then they say, but uh, you need to be with us. I said, no, because you are the young generation. You know exactly what you need for your business. Mm -hmm. You know exactly what you need for your future. Now here you will come to me, but then I will tell you this will work and this will not work. So don't be upset because maybe I will tell you, no, this will not work. Dr. Raja, I see you as a, a team player in, in Al Gurg Group, but I also I see Al Gurg uh, Group as a team player in the Emirati ecosystem. Yeah. Tell me more about the efforts of uh, the group in terms of supporting and uh, its impact on the community. Uh, well, the group has been supporting the community not from now, it's right from the, in the 90s, you know where the chairman was really uh, uh, doing his CSR without him knowing yani, that this is called CSR for the it's community. It's a habit. Yeah, it is a, a habit. It's a habit. And uh, uh, we all learned from him. We all learned how to serve this uh, country. For me, for example, some of my friends will ask me, you know, you are on this board, you are on this board, you are in this university. How much do you think you are earning every month? I said, see? This is the wrong thoughts, mm. how much I am earning every month. I'm not earning anything from anybody. I don't take money from anybody, from any word, anyone. I serve with my heart, with my guts, with my, and the, yes, true. I don't serve uh, on any board because I want them to pay me at the end of the month 10,000 dirham. I don't, and I will not accept it. And even when I go for my business trips with all these people, uh, the, the whole uh, group, I never ever touch the money of anywhere that they are sending me. I buy my own ticket and I pay for my own accommodation. So that I don't uh, utilize the, uh, the money of the country for my benefit. Mm -hmm. My benefit is my benefit. It's me. I want to go, I pay for myself. But I will never ever ask that somebody should pay me to go and speak about the women issue. I chose that road. I will speak about it. I will pay for it. I'll be more happy to do that, you know. So this is how I work. I remember uh, a sentence in your, in your book, actually, which is related to what you've mentioned, which is uh, people say that um, the devil is in the details, but you see that God is in the details. Of course, God is in the details because we don't have, I don't live with devils, I live with God. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. I, 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 even we were discussing just inside. I said to me, I, I have no uh, issue with the, uh, if I see somebody that uh, they are successful, I really feel happy. You know, and I say, Allah, wa fakum, da da, and I, I, I really pray for them in my heart, yani. And I told you that when I go to sleep on my pillow at night, I have no issue with anybody in the world, nobody. 
that I said, I talked to this lady in a bad way, and I mistreated this person in that way, and I shouldn't have behaved in that way. No, I keep my distance. There is a limit. There is a, 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 a full stop there. There, I respect myself, and that's how I gain the respect of the people. Because you live an intentional life, and uh, yeah, and this conscious. is what you leave behind yeah. you. And uh, there is a book that I would like you to read. Is the, it says that uh, who will cry when you die? Who will cry when, when you, you die. die? Yeah, this book is very very interesting, because there is uh, two venues. When you are born, you know. You are the only one who's crying because you came out to this world and you are in a, in a uh, chaos, right? As a baby, okay? But everybody in that room, in that world, will be jumping in the air. Hey, Fatma, yet, Muhammad, ya, Abdullah, ya, okay? And everybody, but when you die, everybody will be crying, but you will be at peace going. Now, peace is that between you and God. Walakin. Peace is that you are at peace. You are not crying at that time. Uh -huh. huh? So who will cry? Now, what legacy you leave behind you, this what will gauge how good you were there in that society, how good you were there in the, uh, for your people, how good you were there for your children, how good you were there for your family, for your work, for everything. Your nation. So uh, people will miss you. But if you don't leave a legacy of um, uh, 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 respect, uh, 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 something that uh, people will miss, they will say, Allah irhamah fuma, Allah fuma al-kareem. Dr. Raja, who mentored you? My father. Yes, my father. Tell me more about From philanthropy it. side of it, my father and my mother. My mother was, uh, uh, I remember I used to look after her, uh, <laughs> whatever she had from any little money at that time, okay? And uh, Allah irham. Then she used to tell me, uh, she, I, she used to tell me, bring for me uh, five thousand or six thousand or so. I said, but every day you are asking for five thousand, two thousand, three thousand. What are you doing with the money? Yani, I can't see anything. Yani, there, I come to the house. It is the same. Whatever you are putting on the table, we are eating. We know that it is there. But this doesn't cost that much. She said, it's my money. I am asking you to bring, uh, to give it to me. Why, why are you, um, uh, I said, no, I don't uh, uh, say anything. Don't misunderstand me. I will bring it to you. But I just want to know. And I never knew what she was doing with the money until she died. You know? And when she died, I remember when we finished uh, all the three days or the seven days. Allah irhamha. And then the driver told me, he said, uh, you know, madam, I have to take you to where mama used to go. I said, OK, where, where she used to go? He took me to the, uh, the, uh, the vegetable market in Hamriya, in Deira. OK? <laughs> OK? And I said to myself, well, what is he bringing me here? And he said, you know, madam, now they will know the car because I am bringing you in mama's car. That man will come, and that man will come. I said, OK, what to do with them? Yani? He said, no, mama, they will come, and it is very hot. And maybe they are carrying lotus or whatever, any of the vegetables, and it is, yani, it has become soft, and it is not nice to eat and all. Uh, but mama will buy it from them. And she will ask me to put it in the boot. And she will give them the money for the whole uh, cartoon. And she will say, you go home now. Don't stand in the sun. And then after, I said, and then afterwards, what do you do with this old rotten things, you know? He said, no, we go to the baladiya, to the municipality uh, garbage uh, bin, and we throw it there. OK? So that she doesn't leave that man to stand in the yeah. heat. He finished from there, and he took me to all the houses that she used to take meat, she used to take fish, she used to, uh, whatever she used to. He says, these houses, she used to come and give. And up to date, now that is 28 years. These houses, whether now the people died and their children are there, but still I'm giving. This is one of the secrets of the blessings on the business even. Exactly, exactly. This is one of the True. lessons that we, we, we need to reflect on. Actually, Dr. Raja, I wanted to ask you a question regarding to one of the stories that you've shared earlier, which is, you mentioned that you've made it in uh, English literature. Yes. And I see you as a, as a literate. I see you as a philosopher. I see you. And how, <laughs> actually, well, you the I, things I, that are so, so deep. 
هونستلي زين بمجامله الله يخليك ف why did you major in English literature and yeah, and how did that impact you yeah i uh, of course um, i remember that uh, of course at, in 1973 we went to kuwait there was no university here and uh, of course even uh, um, here the al ain university was not open yet you know and uh, i went uh, of course in my um, application i have written siyasa wa iqtisad siyasa wa iqtisad that is uh, economic the three options uh, the three options the same okay <laughs> And I went, I, I sent my papers through the ministry. And uh, when I went there, I was not accepted in siyasa wa iqtisad, politics and uh, economy. And I went to the, uh, uh, to the dean at that time. She's, she was a lady. I, uh, until now, I remember her because I met her with Sheikh Nhaya. Okay. And I said, uh, I am from United Arab Emirates. And uh, I have applied for um, uh, economic, uh, economics and politics, but uh, you didn't give me a chair there. She said, no, we don't have. It's all full. And we don't have. We have an uh, Islamic culture. I said, I don't want Islamic culture. I know how to pray. I know my prayers and my own. Why should I go and, and <laughs> study? And your values and ethics are a great <laughs> example of Islamic culture. True. Then I, True. Said, I said, I will not. You're yani, living at it. that time, of course, I was 18 years old. Yani, you know? So that was my thoughts. Yani. Yes. Maybe now if they tell me, I would say maybe yes. Matadri, yani, OK? And uh, then she said, uh, uh, there is no Arabic language. I said, no, I don't want Arabic language. Adri, I don't want Arabic language. Why is it OK? <laughs> <laughs> then she said, look, there is a chair in the English section, the English literature. Take it or leave it and take your plane and go back to Dubai. And that was as if somebody slapped me on my face. And in 1973, had I come back from Kuwait back to Dubai, my father would have killed me. What did you do there, yani, to send you, or the, the university to send you back, and they wouldn't allow you to study in the university? I said to myself, uh, there is method in the Arabic, I said, OK, I'll take English, because English will always be uh, the language yani, of the uh, uh, fi. And I took the English literature, and it was not my uh, ambitions for the English literature. Yani. And once upon a time, I was in Zayed University going to do the opening speech, and Sheikh Nhayyan was there. And I was sitting at that chair there. And there was a lady that I looked at her. I said to myself, oh my god, she's the one who ruined my, uh, my Education. career. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know? And I said, then Sheikh Nhayyan, of course, uh, Allah yahfaza, yani he's always been. Uh, supportive, uh, he said, come, come here, Raja, next to her. Then she said, uh, uh, you speak, uh, when I spoke, uh, I, oh, I did the opening, it was in English. Huh? She said, uh, your English is good. I said, yes, I studied in Kuwait. Huh, you are from Kuwait? Uh, you studied in Kuwait? I said, yes, in Kuwait University. And I remember I came to you and I said, I want to study. <laughs> Told her the whole story. But you never allowed me, you know? But you know what? At that time, we give the, the, our cards, you know, business cards. When I gave her my business card. I said, if you need anything in economics, I am there, you know, as a business lady. <laughs> you, you've mastered economics. And then Sheikh said, what But see, I managed, alhamdulillah, that I, uh, uh, without studying uh, four, five, ten years or what, whatever in business, that I am, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, uh, up to that standard, I am successful. I don't want to say bad too much. It was up to that standard that I'm running my business successfully. And uh, alhamdulillah, uh, everything is fine. You're being humble. Dr. Raja, thank you so much for those enlightening uh, responses. Um, now it's time to open the floor um, to our esteemed audience. And they would like to welcome your questions and reflections, uh, and we are here to facilitate a dynamic discussion. So please feel uh, free to, to ask, uh, whether in English or in Arabic language, 
and we want to ensure that everyone's voice is heard. So please raise your hand or either approach the microphones and we'll gladly take your questions. Father. 